they came up with with to me and that and then you get to change. No. Like at all. Yeah. Alright, let's why don't we start we should start, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So last time or the time or currently you are teaching the kids portraiture and um, you're doing the portrait of the Lavoisiers. And you'll put this canvas up, although I came prepared for this canvas, but actually they are, you know, both examples of the type of history painting, of neoclassical history painting that David, you know, uh, perfected and actually raised to the highest art form of the time. It was the most prized, highest level, most valued kind of art. And that was narrative painting, narrative history painting. Paintings that, import, that imparted a moral lesson. It's hard to do. Um, so they're somewhat familiar if you talked about the biography of David. You know, they, they will be familiar with them. You can put this canvas up and say, you can start with the usual interrogative of what do we see? What is this a painting of? And since I haven't looked at this for a while also, what, what do we see? What is this a painting of? It's a painting of men and what else? And some women. Here are the men, here are the women. Um, it's obviously painted, you know, from, a, from long ago. It's a historic painting because the, the attire of the people. Um, some of the older kids might say, you know, that they're Roman soldiers or, you know, soldiers from an ancient time, which they are. And um, there, there are one, two, three men over here with their arms raised in some sort of a pledge of some sort of allegiance. Um, and here is, you know, a, a fourth gentleman and their swords are being held aloft. So they're, so you can ask them to speculate what kind of, what is this painting telling us about? It's some sort of a story. This, these paintings that we're looking at this time are not portraits, they are narrative paintings. And you can say to them, what's a narrator? When you see a, read a book or, or see a play, what is the narrator? What is the narrator's job? To tell the story. So these paintings tell us a story. It's almost like a snapshot in the middle of a story. And very often, um, what's portrayed in the story is a moment that most people will recognize. This may not be so familiar to us because we're not so versed in the classics in the story of the Oath of the Horatii, which is what this is, the painting is called, and it's about this pledge that the Horatii brothers, sons, made, you know, to uphold the honor of their, their family. Um, but for example, if you, you know, if you call up on your whiteboards, there are paintings of Hagar in the wilderness, you know, or, or of um, Mordechai and Esther. There are all sorts of biblical illustrations of history painting that you can conjure up for the kids and say, when we look at this, we immediately know what this is about, and, it, and we also know what the lesson that's associated with this image is. So this was painted by David, who also painted the Lavoisiers, and we know that he was painting at the time of the French Revolution, and that he was very active politically, and for some reason he was able to successfully, you know, go between different factions. You know, he would he was in support of Robespierre at one time, and uh, he's painting the Lavoisiers, but Lavoisier unfortunately ended up being guillotined. But somehow David was able to nimbly avoid that fate and then go on to serve um, other kings and and Napoleon, and that and actually. I mean, I didn't really, I, I feel like we have to talk about this, and maybe with your older kids it's appropriate, but in terms of what's happening in, in France and, you know, in the world today, you know, the power of image, and what they should know about David is that he was really the first, in addition to being the consummate artist and to restoring the principles of neoclassicism to French art and elevating that to the highest standard in art, um, he was the consummate political propagandist, and that images do have power, particularly in a time when there weren't other images. We didn't have TV coming at us 24-7, and we didn't have various outlets for information. So the image was particularly important at this time, and what David sought to do in his imagery was to um, communicate lessons about how citizens of the new republic should be conducting themselves. And so in this, 
in this ancient, we, we talk about neoclassicism, it refers back to Greek and Roman culture, to classic culture and classic architecture. Um, and so it takes the lessons of antiquity and brings them home to us today, in his time. And what was he communicating? And that is that the citizens should be willing to die for the republic. That, you know, that there's a, a lesson of patriotism involved here. And the story of the Horatii is the story of the family of the Horatii, and for some reason they were pledged to do battle with the family of the um, Curiati, I think they are, um, and, they, and they vowed to fight to the death. And you'll see here that these are the sisters of the Horatii, and maybe even the mother, and they are weeping because they know the outcome of this battle will be lost, that either their brothers will be lost, and in fact, one of the sisters was married to one of the opposing team, and so she knew that it was a lose-lose proposition for her in any case. So, um, what are the principles of, of neoclassic painting that, that David, you know, um, elevated to the highest level of art in France at the time. There's a, and we know this from looking at the portrait of the uh, Lavoisiers, there's a simplicity and an austerity of line. Line is, is paramount above all things, above all the other elements of art, above color and even light um, or, or even space. Uh, the purity of line and of form is the hallmark of, of um, neoclassical painting and even in situations where you have, you know, emotional content and, and heroism being portrayed, there's not a lot of um, of um, emotionality or or even movement. There's even though we know that they're saying hail, you know, we pledge whatever they're about to do. If you ask the kids, what is it you might hear at this time? As you know, if we were to tune in to this particular scene, you might hear them saying, "We promise, Father, that we will do whatever it is." But there's still this this restraint and sense of quietude. And that comes largely as a, as a function of the lines and the way the painting is executed. Um, so, since we know that line and form, meaning shape, um, are hallmarks of this neoclassic art, you can ask the children to point out some of the lines and the implied shapes that they see. Does anyone want to do that? You might have kids come up or just from where they are do it. And again, on the smart board. Pardon me? If you pull it up on a smart board, right. again, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun for them, but it's also... Or if they have copies of them or whatever, but you can, you know, obviously there, you know, there are some very strong verticals that, that you know, inform the painting and divide it. Um, it's very interesting in terms of, like, depth. There is a sense of depth that's created by these alcoves with the arches, but for the most part, um, David has lined up the main players, almost like um, a Greek frieze along the top of a building. You know, they're they're very, you know, front and center. Um, and even though there's, you know, there are three of them, and there has to be some stacking involved, they all seem very frieze-like and very much in the foreground of the painting. Um, there's all sorts of geometry, line and shape in this. There's, you know, the linearity and the blocking of the, the mason, you know, the stone floors. Um, you know, the, even the, the simple cornices along the columns, it, there's a, a, not a lot of embellishment. It's all very, um, I keep using this word austere, but it's very clean. Um, even, you know, there is draping. Obviously, these are the human forms, so we know that human organic forms tend to have more curve to them, so there is the draping as their, their togas follow the lines of their bodies, and you see their, their muscles delineated in their, in their legs and in their arms. Um, this is their father. He's holding their swords, and they're pledging their fealty to him. Um, they form a very solid shape here, you know, that, that's not going to roll away or be blown in the wind. And that's, you know, the implied triangle. The father, again, is an implied triangle. And even the sisters, in their despair form, solid triangle. So there's a lot of static, calm, and quiet. There's, even though there's the movement, the upward movement, you know, you know, whenever you have a diagonal line that implies some sort of either um, um, flying up or, or descending, so there's movement implied in that. But for the most part, even though this is an, a very emotionally charged scene, it's rendered in the classic neoclassic style. And that's, you know, with simplicity and great grace. Um, 
the way that Debbie does inject some excitement into this this static um, uh, composition that he's created is can anyone guess what element of art he does to create a little bit of energy and to to you to get you to use your eye to to make it more cohesive? Did you say red? Someone said red. And you you had another color color. So the other element of art that sort of unifies the canvas and makes us more active in how we take it in is the unification of the color. You know, there's there's the white that's you know passed throughout, but the red is what jumps out of, at us and energizes the, the canvas in some way. The red here in this sun and faintly echoed in the sister over here, and then again reinforced by the father. So there's great strength and solidity of purpose and. And it's important to know that David knew exactly what he was doing. Everything was extremely thought out and meticulous. And there was a, definitely a message that he was communicating. And I mean, with your older kids, if you choose to discuss you know, the events of France and, and the fact that France is the birthplace of the Enlightenment, and that actually a few years after this, when we have Napoleon in power, he was the first to extend rights of full citizenship to the Jews. It was sort of the golden age for us in France. Which is what, well, yes? I'm sorry, I don't know if I missed the beginning of the but I don't see where this is Right. Yeah, I didn't have this either. I, I actually, and when we, and I'm not sure. I didn't any discussion you know what? I'm going to write something up because I wasn't prepared to do this. And, when, and I'm not sure that it's at the I, this is this is usually this is the death of Socrates. I will, so you know what? Let's be prepared for both. The fact is, both of these. It's no, it's good. No, so you, what, what I have from the last round is this. Is the is the is yeah, not, but it, I don't know if it was visiting at the time or. I don't. I don't. So what do we have? What do we have? We have the death of Socrates. Do you other people remember doing the death of Socrates? Well, we, we learned the Ocean and the Democratic Society. So I have the previous go round of this is, is this. So the new one we need to email. So, but you know what? In case you can, you can get a poster or, or you end up calling it up on the whiteboard, this will be at the net for sure. This I don't know. The okay, fact is, no, the fact this is, and you have a discussion of the death of Socrates, so then let's just migrate to that for a minute because the fact is you're very similar canvases and this is the medium within which you know David was working and actually you can ask the kids and you can bring in the Lavoisier uh, reproduction which you don't have a very good one it's very dark but you can say can you see certain similarities in the way he painted this personal intimate portrait of two people that was you know just a portrait you know for their purposes and also the way he painted these larger canvases that were meant for public consumption you know to to sort of inform the populace yes and the answer is yes. You know, the answer is yes and no. The answer is that artists well, didn't exist. Well, it's not really the Horatii, and it's not really Socrates. But yes, there were people that would pose, and that in fact, artists studying at the Academy de Beaux Arts had the advantage of doing figure studies from live models. So yes. Absolutely, there were people. Now, what? Because this was not like the impressionist, not something that he would do in a month. It would take a long time for him to do this. He would do numerous studies and preparatory studies, and and perhaps he may have had the Horatii pledging like this first, and he did a study like that, and then he thought, no, no, that's not dramatic enough. I want it. I want more, you know, energy in it. And he may have then modified the thing. So. So yes, there were people, and and he may have taken his studies and then modified them. It's not, it's not necessarily the case that he had everyone in the canvas posing in exactly that way. He may have then thought, oh, this is too empty here. I'm going to fill in with the young child and the mother consoling them. You know, so there were. So the answer is yes, there were there were models, and and also he had license to improve upon them. Imagine, it might be a childlike way of looking at it, it looks like a scene of 
way to remember what the message is. So if you took the very best snapshot during the time of the play that explained what it was all about, that's what they're doing, the narrative painting. And yes, yeah, so he's having people in the play acting that out, dressing up like that, pulling it together. That's a very good way to explain narrative painting to the kids. Yes. And just as you say, like the narrator is the one that tells the story. And, and typically, you know, the, the images are ones that people are familiar with and that, that spark recognition in them. Um, so if we are going to talk about the death of Socrates, in many ways it's very similar. It's the same sort of very austere um, stone work. You know, there's not a lot of embellished treatment to draw your eye away. There is an archway. Um, it's positioned differently because the arch, you know, the archway is now front and center. But again, the characters, the main players in the canvas are lined up almost as if in a frieze, very flat and very close to the foreground. How does um, David highlight where he wants your attention to fall? He has light falling on Socrates. You know, he's elevated somewhat and, you know, gesturing in a way that calls attention to him. He's also bracketed, um, you know, by two figures that are dressed in that uh, arresting, attention-getting red. And, and then, you know, since we've talked about the oath of the Horatii and instilling this notion of, of um, serving the Republic in any way that you can, um, here, um, Socrates is a figure who did exist in antiquity and that and you know and um, David was well educated and classically trained and here Socrates has been sentenced to death by the government of Athens um, because he was he was teaching uh, he was an independent thinker and teaching things that they thought were contrary to the nature of government and he believed, and, and now what's happening is actually someone is, is very upset to have to deliver the sentence to him, which is to give him the hemlock to drink. Um, and Socrates could have fled, but he was a man of moral principle. And again, you have this principle of dying for your convictions, belief, which is, you know, I see today. So. But, um, but, you know, believing in, in what it is you stand for, and he's very calm in the face of this. Those around him, you know, this student, Credo, is, is very upset. Apollodorus, you can't see, but he's, you know, leaning against the archway, and he's just, you know, weeping with upset. And there were liberties taken here, too. This, this is supposed to be Plato, who was a very young man at the time, and he's shown as an old man, and in fact, he wasn't even present at this time. Um, going up the stairway, which does provide some sense of depth in this archway beyond here, is Xantippe, the wife of Socrates, because you know she was weeping and just overcome with, with sadness. But he himself is, is not at all concerned. He believed in the immortality of the soul and of ideas and of truth. And in fact, you can ask kids, do they know the name Socrates? Have they ever heard of the Socratic method? And you can say that, in fact, when I ask you that question, I'm practicing the Socratic method because the Socratic method is, a, is still what we use today primarily to engage people in active study. It's, it's posing a series of questions, and I think when we study Torah, we do that too. You're always asking a question and then asking a question about the question, and in that way, by constantly probing the answers, you look for faults or flaws in reasoning, and the Socratic method endures, as opposed to, you know, sort of a fascist mentality where you are told the answers and there's no, no active involvement on your part. So there's a very important lesson for us even today in, in Socrates. You mean the Ninja Turtles? Yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I think for one, they do this all the time, they put their hands up. Well, this is often one on one for all. If you were to do, if you were to do this, you could say, you know, in a harsher, earlier time, we all know that there were penalties of death imposed on people. You know, and I would, chances are they're not going to delve into that. You were saying he was being, he was being punished, and he had the opportunity to run away. But we have, you know, people, in, in the Torah that, that took their punishment, that stayed and endured. I, I wouldn't dwell on that. I would just talk about the fact that he was a great teacher. I mean, I don't know. Have, has anyone done it before? Do you find that children become upset? If you don't dwell on it, but rather talk about the moral lessons of believing in your truth and, you know, of independent thinking and, um, the thing is that, you know, you do want to impress upon older kids, certainly, that, that 
there is a political message that is being communicated. For younger kids, it's just talking about important historic figures, you know, at a moment of tragedy and sadness. And, you know, the idea that he would drink this poison and go to sleep, maybe it's not so terrible. I don't know. You're going to have to be a judge of that. You can, you can just, or else you can just say, you want to point out that there are shackles lying on the floor, you might just say he's in prison, you know. But I think it's, truth is always better. When you start skirting, you don't have to dwell on it. You know, you can say he obviously lived a long, productive life, um, but they were making an example of him. And sadly, th those were harsher times. You know, you can see these are not today's times. You can tell by the way they're dressed, by you know the structure of the building that they're in, that this is a, a moral lesson from ancient times, just as in the Torah. You know, we teach them the Akeda. So, and I think we focused on the elements of art. Well, you can focus in on that, the, in, that in both of them, the elements of, of their... Like kindergarten, I feel like I so maybe that's the option. But I think fighting and, and, right. and someone being sentenced to death are different. Mm -hmm. so, uh, to me, you know, you see it in the same Yeah, but I'm saying, like, in that one, I think we, we kind of just talked about it more as fighting, and then yeah. we, there's a lot of elements It's of battle. Art. It's, it's yeah, not fighting, fighting like, you know, you, yeah. you push me in the hallway. Right. It's, you know, yeah. it's yeah. battle yeah. for, they know we all, we understand. I think Yeah, it's... Um, so maybe I'll write something, a little something up, and I'll I'll send it to you. But but I think that if you opt to do this with older kids, because you do have the discussion of it, and I do think that it's not so threatening. We do know about Socrates, and if they don't, they should. You know, um, each, each of them bears the same elements because you do have this this very important foreground. You know, you have the austerity of line. It's it, the principles of neoclassicism are equally true in both. You take an important, um, ennobling, enriching subject matter that will, you know, elevate the people. Um, and particularly, you know, David was thinking about the events going on at the time uh, and trying to communicate these patriotic values. Um, and also, you have the same importance of line and shape. Um, so, and, and you have the red as the unifying colors. You have the very restricted color palette. Other than that, the colors are not you know, emotional or artificial. Um, there is this attempt at recreation of reality. I mean, there were no cameras at the time, and these do look like people that are, you know, in proportion and, and as they should be. There are no real distortions. I mean, maybe their arms are, you know, elongated, you know, for purposes of, of elegance of line. But, um, you know, and then I think you're, you're okay in, in you know, in either canvas, depending on what you feel more comfortable with, depending on what you have in the book. Um, the light, you know, seems to, you know, it, here it's very much, you know, spotlighting Socrates. Um, and then, you know, in, in the other sections, the peripheral players tend to be, this is much darker than it actually is, are more in shadow, you know, and less highlighted. Although our attention is called, like, you know, the entire, the entire, canvas does create, you know, a, a very stable triangle, and then within those triangles there are smaller triangles of stability. These were people that were resolute in purpose. Um, I think the main lesson for them of David is that David, you know, who we know from last time, actually, ironically, is not buried in France. He, he went into exile, uh, self-imposed exile, but, um, you know, was that this was the zenith of, of French painting, the high point. And we also know for older kids who've studied things that follow, that that the reactions we see in art, even, you know, uh, well, we're not gonna do De La Croix, but the reactions, you know, against the establishment are very much against these strictures and rules that David articulated and, and put in place at the Academy de Beaux-Arts. Most people, you know, then started to feel like, well, I want to communicate more emotionality, or I want to use, you know, the the, uh, the Fauves wanted to use a more expressionistic art. So everything sort of reacts against this high point in classic French painting, this, this return to ancient themes and, um, and purity of line. Um, for him, it was everything. And we know when we studied Angre, Angre was a disciple of David's, that Angre, who then spoke to Degas and said, line is everything. That there is a school that feels that line 
and, and contour and form are the stability and the underpinning of good painting. And then we have a lot of people that come subsequent to that and they want to deviate a little from the norm, from that norm. Um, should we talk more about this? Should we come back to it? Yes. <coughs> Hi. Um, I, I, ha I had written the, um, the write-up from the last time we did this on the Oath of the Horatia, so I can scan it in and just email it around. So everyone has whatever. We could do what we want, or you prefer we do... Which one's hanging in the museum? Definitely the Horatia. Okay. I'm not the, I mean, definitely <laughs> soccer okay, fine. Um, the the, pro you. the project, because I'll find I think Jane, Jane and I were using our old binder, so I apologize, but um, the, the project is, 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 well, it comes in a couple of forms, um, and it's based on the Oath of the Horatii. Here, can I just, um, um, and Jane apologizes, she unfortunately has to be at a funeral this morning, so I'm, I'm Jane, but if you don't like it, please call her. So, <laughs> um, no, I think it, I think it, there are actually two. Um, there are two ideas, depending on what you're comfortable with and with your class. Um, and the, it, based on the Oval Grisha, but I, I think that it can, you know, if you talk more about this, you really can adapt it. Um, and the first is a posing activity. I think we kind of wanted to give everyone something to do without crepas and uh, white paper if you want and if you feel like your class can kind of do this. To split them up um, into groups of nine, and I know everyone's got different sizes of classes, but, um, and to, to basically, we'll have some materials and sheets and some swords, not for fighting, um, but for oath taking, and um, give them an opportunity to stage a narrative. I mean, uh, Nietzsche's not here, but that this this is very posed. It's very staged. This is not fighting. This is a quiet picture, um, and to, for them to get a sense of what that part of the process was for the artist, and to take a picture of them doing that, and that can be their their part of their. Portfolio. Right. Yeah. Composition, um, actually, for artists is something that kids sometimes don't think about. Like when the artist begins, he very often will do a preparatory sketch and composing your image. You know, where you're going to put, put who. And as you said before, did they pose? They pose, but then you know he may take different things that he he drew at different times and move them around and say, oh, that's a more complete, satisfying image. So do they line up straight like this? Do they line up? You know, they have to position themselves in a way, you know, that composes their Right. Are, 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 they, are they really triangles? And the, the kids sitting down below can see, can tell them, you got to be more, or whatever. Right. right. It can, I think it can just be a fun activity if you're up for it and you feel like your kids are, um, and, and maybe enlist some teacher help. Um, I, I personally, I, I don't like free-for-alls in general. Uh, that's just my nature. I, I would, I, but I would come in with, I, I, I think it's, it's not going to serve anyone well to do a free-for-all, and I think that's kind of the point. This was not a free-for-all. Right. You, you three are going to be... You know what? You might want to put the, the rolls on a piece of paper, have them each pull one out, because then you get a lot of, no, I want to be a soldier, right. no, I want to... And if they want to trade, like if a girl gets the soldier and, and doesn't want to do it, which I shouldn't say because she may very well want to do it, or the boy, you know, whatever, you, either they have to suck it up and just do who they are, or if they can do a little horse trading amongst themselves, that's also a skill, you know, but, but just, I think if they pull out random, it eliminates the, oh, I want to be him kind of thing, if you think you have that sort of right. Or if you need to speak with the teachers in advance, there are a couple of people who should not be brothers together. Um, Oh, that's interesting. But I don't know. That's just that's my you know. You, I, I think it it'll it can be a fun, different activity that makes them think in a, in a new way about how the art is made. Um, if, if there's an option two for anyone who wants an option two on the back, and we'll have um, just some white paper, foam shapes and blocks, and they can try to re using different shapes of different sizes. How, when you just put the shape down, how that can also create the composition 
and tell you something about what's going on. So it, it, it is more an emphasis on the elements of art than the narrative, um, but an option. If yeah, I, I actually, yeah. In, in doing that sort of an exercise, if you have a blind sheet and if kids were to lightly sketch, okay, so this is a triangular form here, and then they put one, two, three heads, and then they, they you know, they can then, within those, those actual you know, imply geometries that they've made sort of actual on their on their paper, then they can fill in and see how it is that David went around about doing that and dividing it, you know, with the, the three, you know, sections of archway or, you know, depending on if you do this. I'm, I'm assuming you're doing this with younger kids, but. Um, right. planning I, I, exercise. Yeah, it is a planning exercise, which, which all artists do. Right. So, okay. And it's sort of in, invisible to us. Um, Okay. So I have Delacroix, but we're not going to do Delacroix, who, who was in reaction to neoclassicism, you had coming along the rise of Romanticism, which was a more um, emotional and um, um, sincere response um, by artists. They wanted to invest their campuses with emotionality. We're going to take it here. Okay. Um, Are you yeah, now we'll do Rosa. Oh, so this one we have. Yes. So no one has Delacroix in there. Well, this is the worst thing. Yes, yeah. this is. Well, exactly. What do you see? Okay, again, we are we are either telling a story or depicting something that is recognizable or understandable to the viewer when you look at it. And even though we are looking at this more than you know. 200 years after it was done, we can sort of make sense of what it is that we're seeing. What do we see? What is it? Well, you do see, so the feeling you immediately get, even before you sort of conceptualize what am I looking at, is a sense of movement. As opposed to the stillness of a neoclassical campus, which even though there is obviously a lot of emotional content, is very stately and, and quiet. Yes, so this is a less quiet canvas. Um, what do you see in this canvas? You see horses. Definitely we see horses, a lot of horses, and along with the horses, we see people. Um, this canvas is called the Horse Fair. The Horse Fair was something that occurred regularly in this part of Paris. Um, and I can't remember exactly how it plays into this, but the word carousel has something to do with this because when the Horse Fair would occur, um, the, the people who were showing their horses or buying them would parade them around in a circle and, and I, I really have to find the, the way it's connected but the word carousel does come from the horses going around in the circle <coughs> at this regular horse fair that would occur. Um, in horse addition, fair, is this where they, they are selling the horses? They are showing, yes, people come if they want to buy or sell a horse, they would bring them at this time to this section of Paris, and actually the section of Paris is identifiable by the landscape that we see in the background. Um, it's near the L'Hôpital Saint-Pietri, I think, but um, it, the architecture is still recognizable and it was a known location. And I gotta figure out that carousel location. But um, in any case, if we were to hear the sounds that someone standing here might hear, what might we hear? We might hear a lot of, you know, <laughs> you know like, or you might hear the, the groomsmen like yelling, you know, or, or telling your horses like, whoa, steady, or, you know, or, or whatever. And actually, um, I want to point this figure out because I have been told that this is a self-portrait of Rosa Bonheur that she snuck into the canvas. Um, you, you can say, so we're going to talk about the artist of this painting, um, and what's unusual about this artist is that she, it was a woman. And it was very difficult for women to be artists at this time because they were not permitted to study uh, at the Academy de Beaux-Arts the way men were. They weren't permitted to go in and do figure studies on live models. And so they were precluded from getting all of the basic um, information about anatomy and structure that men were afforded if they wanted to study art. This 
woman, Rosa Bunner, and um, I found one paper that says that she was a, of some Jewish background, that she was actually called, uh, Bunner means um, uh, good time. She was actually called Rosa Mazeltov because her father, who was an artist, was apparently Jewish, although he was very political and he lived in a monastery for a period of time and he was very socialist and he, he was, you know, very out there. Um, but I've heard that, you know, her father's family was Jewish from Belgium. But in any case, she um, was one of four children. She was the eldest. Her family was written, in, written up in a book called Hereditary Genius because all of them are artists. She had three other siblings and all four of them were artists. Her father was an artist, um, but did not manage to achieve great success as just an artist, so he became an illustrator and a teacher. And her mother was a piano teacher, and apparently Rosa was a very unruly child and, and couldn't sit still in school, so her mother took to homeschooling her. And the way she taught her her letters was to tell her to choose an animal, and then she could draw it and write its name. And that's how Rosa learned to write and to read from her mother, Sophie, uh, who was a piano teacher who sadly died when she was 11 years old. She had a very sort of a wild and woolly childhood, or she always loved animals. Her father, um, they tried to apprentice her to a seamstress and that was not successful. Her father acknowledged that she had a talent and he began to instruct her and provide her with instruction. But in order for her to really get the real information that she needed to know about physiology and anatomy, she um, applied for permission to dress in men's clothing and to go to the horse fair and to go into abattoirs and look at the carcasses of dead animals and, and she, she studied from life. She would also go out into the countryside and, and uh, do studies of animals that she saw there, whether cows and sheep and goats or wild animals. But she was always very drawn to animals and in fact her father allowed her to keep a pet sheep on their sixth floor balcony. So um, it was a very unusual childhood, um, but she apparently was understood, and as a result of which, she became one of the preeminent um, painters of animals. And this canvas is enormous. Um, obviously, we're looking at a small reproduction, but it's it's uh, powerful in its dimension, just like Sunday afternoon at the Grand Jacques. This is um, nine by 16 feet, and when we go to the museum, it's usually in a gallery at the back against the back wall, and it's very large. Um, she was originally commissioned to paint um, a painting of oxen plowing a field, and that was very well received, and her other animal canvases were well received, and then she painted this painting, and it, it drew so much acclaim and so much attention that it essentially made her career. And she was awarded all kinds of awards. Um, uh, the uh, Empress Eugenie gave her an award in secret because women were not supposed to be extolled uh, publicly in this way. Uh, Queen Victoria, also a great animal lover, was so taken with this canvas that she asked for a private viewing of it in the castle. And in fact, there is another version of it in England. And, and Rosa Bunner's career was largely um, supported by people outside of France, more than in France. I mean, she was well received, and this was, you know, a very prominent canvas, and, and you know, very much admired. But, um, she, you know, particularly England supported her work and, and purchased a lot of her work. She was a very unusual person, as um, I mentioned. She applied for this um, this um, permission to dress in men's clothing so she would be undisturbed. Um, and the term tons vestirés, to dress, cross dress, comes from this dressing in other, in, you know, other gender clothing. Um, she uh, smoked cigarettes in public. She, you don't have to tell the kids this. She lived with a, a, a childhood friend for 50 years of her life. Um, I have a portrait of her. Um, after her fame and fortune was made, she retreated to uh, her, her home outside of Paris where she kept a menagerie of, of exotic animals. Um, and this is a portrait that was painted by her uh, it, at the end of her life. Um, did I say she didn't ride side saddles? She rode like a man. Um, I think we get the picture. She was a very um, ahead of her time, you know, feminist before feminism existed. Um, and she was, you know, unstoppable in pursuit of, of 
actual, you know, um, uh, studies of anatomy. I mean, she did things that men didn't have to do. She didn't have those luxuries afforded to her, and she went out and, and got the acquired skills. And there are there are lots of um, her her studies of animal uh, anatomy that exist. She also studied science and did dissections, so she had a complete appreciation and understanding. And she was a great lover of animals. Um, the people are are you know sort of secondary to the animal action. Now this canvas, as opposed to the other canvas. Somebody said, what, when I said, what do you see? Someone very nicely responded, motion. And you do see a lot of energy and a lot of motion. And this is not a static composition. And you can imagine that the sounds that would fill the air. And that in the next second, this horse um, is rearing up and making a sound and then coming clomping down and may actually you know, strain at the, at the bit a little bit and try and get out of line. And this one is wrangling this horse you know, to stay in position here. Um, but there's this tr tremendous sense of movement. There is natural light. Obviously, it's a, a s somewhat sunny day. The trees have foliage on them, so you know the men are dressed in shirt sleeves, and the shadows are being cast, you know, directly, you know, underfoot of the horses. Um, what kinds of lines do we see? What kinds of lines communicate energy and motion, as opposed to you know the canvas we saw before, which has a lot of humanity in it, but a lot of the lines are very you know, vertical and very horizontal. Yeah, we will, we will, you will show them side by side. It makes sense at the end to do a compare and contrast, but, but as opposed to some of these very straight, you know, lines, even the lines, you know, here where you have draping, the lines are, for the most part, very straight. What sort of lines do we know that we associate with organic living things? What kinds? Circles, curves, you know, curving lines, imply, you know, circles will roll and curving lines imply um, something that's found in nature. So horses and people are certainly, you know, natural. So the horses are curved in many ways, even, you know, all of their, their, their legs, their, their, what you call this part of a horse's chest, you know, but, you know, the, a horse is a mass of curving lines. The curve, you know, that goes over here. There, so there are curves throughout, and then, you know, the movement is sort of, going across in, in a circular way. There's the feathering of the trees that is also very organic and curving. Um, the heads of the groomsmen, you know, and, and all of that organic biology, you know, the curving line. These people are not, you know, very austere. Everybody's got, you know, natural bent, cur curved, energetic movement and gesture. Um, Oh, in terms of brushwork. Now, you know, when David lifted his hand from the canvas and it was finished, you had a very finished, polished surface. And you wouldn't even have a sense of where he put down a brush. It's, it was the attempt to recreate reality. That was the objective in this kind of a painting. This is also an attempt to recreate reality. It's very, um, um, true to life in its rendering, but there is a sense of, of looser brushwork that you can see, like to, to make these accumulated leaves or even, you know, how the clouds are done. There is a sense, you know, that, and this, this sense is something that's a hallmark of increasingly modern art, that there's no attempt to fully deceive the viewer that this is reality, but it's, an, it's a recreation of reality. So there is still an attempt to recreate reality, but the artist is felt in this canvas much more. You know, these, these lines are not photographic of the trees. There's, there's brushwork that's palpable and visible to us. So we, we have a sense of the artist being present in the work, and then Rosa Bunner does us the favor if this is in fact true, and I think it is true based on on this image, you know, she kept her hair short, that this, you know, she even, you know, really wanted to be in the canvas. Um, and part of what makes it true, which is similar to the other one, she had to create surface anatomy. Say it again. Surface anatomy. You can actually see an actual muscle that she was sitting there studying and she's walking in the beach up. Not to bring up her death. Right, you, there is, there is, a, well, with her horses, you can see, when we see this canvas, you'll see like that the horses are rippling and you will see them straining, and there is actual scientific underpinning and physiology. That's also very much the case here. I mean, you know, these well-developed muscles and, 
and, and things like that obviously show that David too studied the human anatomy and you know it's true to life. There, there is a certain, um, it's not mannerist exactly, but there is a certain um, elegance and, and um, liberty taken with the extension of the arms. You know, they're a, a little bit longer than maybe is proportional for purposes of, of um, you know, greater intensity and, and um, strength, I guess. Um, but, but here you have a more naturalistic situation um, and it's something that did occur routinely and she is painting a subject that is not of historical um, import. It's just something that struck her as very beautiful and, and you know, seeing all these beautiful animals being paraded, you know, around uh, this, this circle in the square, of, uh, the circle in the square, uh, like the theater of France. Um, so this is not um, a history painting. It's not meant to ennoble or in any way, but it's, it's, um, it's connecting with the natural world. And, and that is more of the movement that followed neoclassical painting, is to appreciate beauty in nature. You know, we're skipping over Delacroix, but this idea of, you know, the romantic poets and, uh, you know, Shelley and Byron and Keats and Wordsworth and, and all these other poets, like, communicating and finding beauty in the natural world, and we know the American Hudson River School, looking for the sublime in nature and man contemplating nature and there being an emotional connection and Rosa de Bonheur in particular maybe you know because of the loss of her mother or whatever was very connected with animals and loved them and many people particularly the English which is why I guess she was so popular there appreciated you know nature and beauty in animals we know even today the queen has her corgis and she takes them out to the stable and you know so um, so this is a departure from neoclassicism. This is somewhat of a low subject. It's also, um, she had experiences with these creatures, which in general, and also with the design of the as you said. Yes. And so she had to do this painting from her, from her gut. From her heart. From her soul. Whereas yes. Delacroix was in a studio. No, um, David. David, David was in a studio. David was in a studio painting off. Right. It, yes. Even like so, when we think about subject matter, but you have to remember, there's a number of years that separate them, and their purposes in painting were very different. He was, you know, a, a propagandist and, and, you know, in service to whoever was ruling at the time, and also he had studied um, in Italy, and you know, and was particularly impressed by what he saw in Italy. I think I mentioned last time he said that. The years he spent in Italy and the sketchbooks he filled there, it was as if cataracts had been removed from his eyes. He suddenly saw things in a different way. And um, and he worked in different times. He was uh, amidst all of the political upheaval. Uh, and within all of that political upheaval, which he contributed to with a lot of his imagery, um, he found this, it's almost, it's almost an oxymoron, this very quiet, austere, linear, stately way of communicating very important and at times very dangerous themes. I mean, we don't talk about the painting that he did of Marat, who was, you know, a, a rabble rouser at the time, but it's it's iconic and it's very political and it's, it's almost like, you know, the image of, it, everyone knew it, like the image of Che, you take a revolutionary and you, you, you make them an icon in a way. He, you know, he portrayed, he, in this case, the, the brush was mightier than the sword, in David's case. He wielded his, his brush in a very calculated, um, thought out, methodical, rational, and that's one of the hallmarks of, of um, neoclassicism, is a certain rationality and, um, and um, clarity. Clarity of form and clarity of purpose. You are looking at a particular um, narrative or image and you are extracting a, com a message from it, and you are communicating that. Um, here, as you say, Rosa Bonheur had a great natural instinct and love of animals and people, you know, things that happened in painting where uh, landscape painting became more respected and admired and uh, appreciated in different places, starting in Holland and still life painting. So lower subjects, subjects that are not taken from history with some some purpose of, you know, uh, politically galvanizing us um, were acceptable and in fact desirable. 
And here, she paints with an obvious love and appreciation of both the power and the beauty of the natural world. This one? Where she got this pose in her right, this walking around, <coughs> especially with pride. Of course, it's not, it's not a model pose, it's just knows that character. Instinctively, how you have to adjust yourself. You know, they say that horses are attuned to the, the movements of people that handle them. Like, if you're a first time rider and you're scared, they know. And so the, the people that handle them handle them with a certain, you know, firmness of purpose. Things I should have done with my dog, but I never did. <laughs> and as a result, he's a fat father. <laughs> but anyway, um, but uh, that, no, but it's true. You know, she does have this um, innate appreciation and love, and this is only one of the many canvases that we see of hers. Uh, unfortunately, we get to see this one because it is—it was her defining moment. This was the, the the work that brought her all of the attention and and accolades that allowed her to enjoy the rest of her life and made her quite a, a successful, wealthy woman. Yes. Why do we need this? It's distracting. Why do we need the tower? It's distracting. It's annoying to me. Well, I think if you're Parisian, if you're Parisian and you're and you're, you want to locate this, and you you know you actually do feel a certain like, oh yeah, there's like the Yucca Five Corners, you know, like whatever, you know, it does it does orient. I mean. This is an actual scene. It's an actual scene that played itself repeatedly. It played itself out repeatedly. So I think, you know, she is, um, they say that it is geographically um, correct. That sometimes, you know, I did Goya in another class recently, and we know that when he did his painting of Toledo, he loved the church. The church was good to him. He painted in the church. So he flipped the location of the town hall and the church so that the church had more prominence. Sometimes people want to put things in that are resonant with them. She is accurately reflecting where this is happening. So for those who could recognize it, you know, this is just another, you know, thing to connect to and adds to the verity of what it is she's depicting. But again, the way she shows this and the way she shows this are very different. And that's what I mean, like David would never do something so ethereal and so bordering on impressionistic. Well, this your your where does your eye go? How is line you know, let's talk about elements of art point four first. Okay, so color and you know does play an important role. For here for us, the white of these horses here that are sort of massed together, contrasting against the, the green of the trees and then you know the the dirt on the on the ground, that draws your eyes over there and that's actually where there's a lot of power pulling our eyes across the canvas that way. And again, I guess what's similar to the, um, the oath of the Horatii where he lined people up almost, you know, almost like, you know, Egyptian, you know, sculpture, very flat against the front. Yes, these people are, are these um, animals and people are lined up against, closer to the foreground of the canvas, but not direct, you know, immediately in the foreground, but still there's, there's more movement and curvature. The way these tree, the tree line curves down, you can see that, you know, there's a difference between where these horses are positioned and where these horses coming slightly around the bend are. And these people are positioned, you know, a little further back. And then, yes, your eye is drawn over here. But not, not in a profound way. The, the most, you know, contrast and light seems to occur here. The shadows are strongest here. The contrasts are strongest here. And then you've got this, you know, feathery, you know, treatment, impressionistic treatment of the sky, um, and then this is sort of shaded in haze or whatever it is. It's a hazy day. Um, the colors, again, not a tremendous, you know, variability in in color palette, um, but there are some profound contrasts. And what color does Rosa Bonheur use to to unify the canvas or to like connect our eye? There are a couple of colors. I mean, she does it with the blue. There's blue, you know, there's the blue here, there's blue in the sky, there's blue, blue, and more blue over there, and blue peeking through in that area. Um, and then, you know, the white is, you know, front and center, that's the, the equivalent of the red, but then you have, you know, the contrast between these two horses, this, this very dark brown or black, you know, uh, stallion, and this white one, and then the white punctuating throughout also. So. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of tumult going on here, uh, a lot of energy, a lot of excitement, and a lot of natural beauty. 
whereas there is nothing found in nature in this canvas. Everything here, other than the people, you know, and these people are bending themselves, except for the women who are weeping and giving into emotionality, you know, to some higher power and higher will. This is this is suffused with with you know romantic contact with the beauty of nature and the power of nature. Um, so two very different canvases. And this this in some ways not she's not a direct rebeller against anything, but this was permitted by what came in between these two canvases. You know the, the things that people did to free up the brushwork to allow her to paint a subject from life that that doesn't have historical importance, um, but has maybe social or emotional gratification and meaning. Um, I found the carousel oh. reference. So the Spanish conquerors saw this game played, and this, tell me if this is what you're talking about, played in Turkey, brought it back, and called it, well, the Spanish word carousella means little war, but it was a game that they started playing um, and traveled to France game of horse and chess and it became like an upper upper class French upper class game. Like it was like jousting and it started with jousting and then that was the an Arab thing. They said going to certain class and fall. Oh really? Show off it's, their so it's right, but I knew it entailed riding horses they aimed, around. They aimed wooden lances at rings suspended from tree limbs by bright ribbons. Oh, so it's like oh, a like Morgan Eve like thing, but but they would do it in a circle. I do know that. I remember that part. Yes, I hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Parading the horses around the yeah. sort of origin of this parasite. So again, so there's much more uh, curving, naturalistic, organic line because of the content of the painting. But again, what sort of shape is portrayed here? And in a funny way, you know, while of course, you know, you have the apex of the canvas with this, you know, you have the tree line obviously, but the horse's head. So there's a very shallow triangle, but it's almost also as if it's a, in a way a, a rectangle of sorts. Um, the, the triangle, it's not really so triangular here because there is less stability. There's much more movement. There's actually, you know, there there's always sort of a, some sort of implied triangle to, to root the canvas, but this one doesn't have that, such definitive, you know, groupings that imply stability. This one really is much more loosely constructed in terms of geometry and, and implies sort of a rolling, like a tumbleweed, a curving line, and that implies a lot of movement and a lot of energy. So it's not only the curving lines of the figures uh, individually, but the overall sense of the canvas implies movement and energy and something living, organic, and natural. Um, questions? Complaints? So, I mean, she was there, like, painting this outside? <laughs> she would go routinely. She might, you know, you know, paint one section, you know, sketch. Typically, she wouldn't come, I don't believe, she wouldn't come with her paint necessarily. She'd come and sketch, and knowing what she knew about anatomy, you know, would then go back and flesh out. She may have on occasion asked one of the men if he would pose for her, you know, but um, but she, unlike male artists of the time, was not privileged to study at the Academy of Mozart and learn all of this stuff collectively with them. And so her achievement is actually, you know, quite outstanding for her time. And obviously she was a certain type of, you know, energetic, not to be held back kind of personality. And fortunately for her, you know, she found herself, or maybe that's why, she found herself in this family of artists and, you know, her father recognized her talent. She wasn't going to be a seamstress sitting there quietly, painstakingly following someone else's pattern. She had an agenda of her own. And, and unlike most women at the time, she was one of the few who not only was encouraged and allowed to pursue this course, she achieved great, you know, success as a result of it.